Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I wonder if um, our residents still have some brain power for uh, the presentation today. I understand your session this morning was uh, was uh, very productive. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. It's a great day. Um, our guest, our speaker today is Mohammed Al Hajj. He came to us from. Uh, Case West, uh, Case West Reserve University, where he did his APCP, and he is doing a uh, search path fellowship with us this year. Next year, he's moving on to uh, do another fellowship in uh, University of Pittsburgh in transplant pathology, focusing on liver pathology. <coughs> Mohammed uh, was in involved in several research projects during his uh, fellowship here. And what you are going to see today is, um, is one of the many research projects he did, but it is very special, at least to me, because it will show you uh, a seed, a, a, a research, one of the research seeds that was planted in the department last year, and the value of staying focused of, for the resident and uh, trainee to reinvest in our existing resources. The series that Mohammed will be using today was actually uh, collected by a former fellow, uh, Iwana, from last year, who used it in a project with Dr. Klein, and that project was also um, uh, very, very productive in terms of publication. Mohammed came to us, and he saw this uh, uh, gold mine, and he invested uh, in it. The other reason this presentation is very special is because it shows the uh, value of uh, faculty supervision. Um, this project is one of many, many uh, innovations and uh, improvement that Dr. Fatshen Lee has been doing in our department. He mentored Mohammed and he worked with him on this presentation, and I'm quite sure that you will uh, enjoy it this morning. Um, um, thank you so much, Dr. Khalifa, for the kind words and for the presentation. And for the presentation, uh, the topic today uh, is, is one dear to my heart. Um, I worked with Dr. Lee and Dr. Khalifa on this project. Uh, by the time I got here in July, uh, it's about six SOX17 expression in endometrial carcinomas. Uh, as you know, we are always in the search for new prognostic and for new diagnostic markers in the world of uh, human oncology. Uh, to start, I have nothing to disclose, but if anybody here is willing to uh, contribute to my disclosure list, please uh, let me know. Uh, also, part of this presentation, um, or this presentation was made at the US CAP this year. Uh, me, Dr. Lee, uh, and Tracy, uh, our wonderful PSF, presented this at the US CAP. This is us, so that Dr. Khalifa knows that we were there. It's me, we presented, we were there by our posters. We did not do any sightseeing. We did not go to the Space Needle. Uh, so a quick overview of this uh, presentation. Uh, I will briefly introduce endometrial carcinomas. Uh, we will go very briefly through the molecular aberrations. We will focus on beta-catenin mutations. Uh, the wingless beta-catenin canonical pathway. Uh, we will also talk a little bit very briefly about diagnostic challenges. Uh, I will try to justify this project. I will want the audience to see this pro project through my own eyes uh, and how we went through the sequence of our thought sequence and how we did this. Uh, we'll also discuss a little bit, uh, because time will not allow, but a little bit about SOX17 uh, as a prognostic marker and as a diagnostic marker uh, used in other carcinomas other than endometria. So to start this presentation, uh, to put things in perspective, endometrial carcinoma is the 10th most common cancer um, in humans. When we only look at females, uh, this is about number nine, because you can see here prostate cancer is way up there on the list. Uh, it's about three. 0.3% of all newly diagnosed cancer cases and about 6% of newly diagnosed cancer cases in women. Uh, there are about 25 per 100,000 women uh, diagnosed with endometrial carcinoma each year. 4.4 uh, in 104,000 women will die of endometrial carcinoma each year. 
Uh, the lifetime risk for endometrial cancer is about 2.8% uh, for all women. And also, as of 2012, the statistics, uh, about 62,000 women live with endometrial carcinoma. And I think this number here shows us that cancer is becoming, very slowly becoming more of a chronic disease. Uh, there are issues with endometrial cancer. I was particularly concerned by this flat line from the series of statistics. Uh, it shows that mortality and prognosis and survival has not improved since the 1970s when CIRS started keeping data. You will also notice that there was a dip in the diagnosis, but then uh, endometrial cancer relatively stayed um, constant throughout the years, throughout the decades. We might see just a little bit of an increase at the turn of the century. Um, which is in comparison to colon cancer and prostate carcinoma, in which we were able to decrease the incidence, we were able to improve survival, uh, we were not able to do the same with endometrial carcinoma. Of course, this goes to early detection, uh, early intervention, and uh, colonoscopy and PSA allowance. If we can do the same with endometrial carcinoma, we'll probably um, uh, also be able to decrease the amount of endometrial cancer in women. Uh, briefly on endometrial carcinoma, uh, it's the most common invasive malignancy in women uh, in, in the genital tract in, in females, and that owes, of course, to pap smears. Uh, cervical carcinoma used to be much more common 50 years ago, but now what we see is endometrial cancer. Uh, it occurs usually in postmenopausal women between the ages of 55 and 65. Um, only 40% of endometrial carcinomas are um, diagnosed in women below the age of 40. Usually these women have other risk factors and explanations why they get uh, endometrial carcinomas and they're usually of the, let's say, the lower grade variant of endometrial carcinoma. Uh, as Dr. Khalifa likes to point out when we are struggling uh, to diagnose endometrial cancer, endometrial cancer always reveals itself. The most 80% of women present with postmenopausal bleeding. If you get a biopsy that is not diagnostic, do not go out of your way to make a diagnosis of endometrial cancer. She will be re-biopsied again because the endometrial bleeding will not stop. So that's one of his points. Uh, also, we, we, in pathology and in medicine generally, we like to put things in categories. Uh, and, and to do that, sometimes these categories are not accurate. They might not completely represent the biology of tumors and cancer. But what we attempted to do uh, with endometrial cancer decades ago is put it in two groups. There is a group that does better. There is a group that does worse. So we call them type 1 and we call them type 1, type 2. Type 1 is estrogen dependent. Uh, that is the type that happens in younger women. It happens in postmenopausal women at the age of about 50. And it's usually low grade. It's what we call endometrioid cancer with five grades, one, two, and three. Type two endometrioid cancer is estrogen independent. Uh, it happens in women who are older than that. They're in their 70s, in their 80s. Uh, and it's usually a more aggressive form of cancer. It's high grade, it's poorly differentiated, and it spreads wide. Here, I summarize type 1 um, adenocarcinoma uh, of the endometrium, and that is what we know, what we call as endometrioid adenocarcinoma. And the reason for the term endometrioid is that histologically, it resembles benign endometrium or the normal endometrium. You look at it, sometimes we even struggle. Is this benign? Is this malignant? Does it fall in this spectrum of hyperplasia or is it our dry cancer? Uh, and that's what we call well differentiated. It's usually estrogen driven. Uh, I, I lump here, as you can see, obesity, polycystic ovary disease, and diabetes together because they commonly occur together as a risk factor in women uh, for endometrial cancer. And basically, aromatase, in, uh, aromatase activity and adipose tissue uh, produces estrogen. And as you will see in the subsequent slides, that unopposed estrogen activity can lead to hyperplasia followed by carcinoma. Nelliparity and familial syndromes are way down on the list. Much more common than that is exogenous estrogen therapy that we don't often think about, and also uh, tumors producing estrogen such as stromal glucosis. Uh, I will touch briefly on the genetics, so I will not mention them here and mention them again. 
uh, here is a picture of, uh, this is an etched e picture of endometrial adenocarcinoma, the endometrioid type. You can see that this is a gland reforming and touching another gland here with no intervening stroma between them. But what you will see is that these are glands. You will be able to make glands out of these with lumens and abdominal cells uh, and the whole architecture. Uh, to touch very briefly on P53 expression on these lower grade tumors, it is what we call the wild type pattern of expression in which we will see a lot of negative nuclei but very few nuclei here, there, there, and there that are retaining P53 protein in their nuclei. Type 2 endometrial adenocarcinoma, or as what some people call it, non-endometrioid type, because of its morphology, it doesn't look like normal endometrial tissue. This is high grade. This is in the seventh, eighth decade of life. It spreads widely. It's a progressive disease that cannot be easily controlled. Uh, it's mainly serous carcinoma. The reason I put clear cell carcinoma here because we don't really know where it fits. It's not type 1, it's not really type 2. The molecular genetics are different. The behavior is somewhat different, but it is a high grade carcinoma. But I will remind you that the molecular effects in clear cell carcinoma of the endometrium are not clearly outlined. We have done a much better job in um, clear cell carcinoma of the ovaries since we see it more and it's more clear cut and we recognize it more. Uh, and these have been found to be added one um, or added to a mutated. The genetics of endometrial carcinoma type 2 is basically P53 mutation truncation. Here is a micrograph, uh, an HNE micrograph of serous adenocarcinoma. I would like to point to you that you don't actually see gland, really gland formation. What you see are sheets of hybrid cells that are forming papillae and that had slit-like spaces, high-grade nuclei. Um, the diagnosis of high-grade carcinoma really is nuclear, and also architectural, but I do like, it's, it's mostly nuclear. It's, these are really high-grade nuclei they are really striking. P53, in comparison to the previous P53 immunostain that we have looked at, P53 protein is intact, not intact, I would like to say retained in all tumor nuclei, and that is a mutated variant by mutation, P53 is retained in the nuclei. This here is uh, a slide that basically summarizes type 1 and type 2. I will not go through this slide in detail, but I would like to point your attention that type 2 spreads into the peritoneum. Uh, it goes crazy into the peritoneum. Um, while type 1 is, it is invasive, it invades the myometrium, sometimes it's not even invasive but it doesn't spread crazy in the peritoneum the same way type 2 does. And also that with endometrioid carcinoma, sometimes we do see concurrent ovarian carcinomas. It's, it's, it's common. Uh, it's very commonly seen, and sometimes we even say, hi, is this a primary or uh, a metastasis, or how are they related? Sometimes they're just synchronous tumors. We know that endometrioid adenocarcinoma arises in endometriosis uh, in the ovary, and that is common. Also, clear cell carcinoma does the same thing. Uh, why that is not common in type 2, but we also see this phenomena of Mullerian and rest in which you have high grade serous carcinoma everywhere. You don't know which one's the primary, you don't know which one's the metastasis, but for purposes of staging and patient treatment, that really does not uh, change things. The prognosis is still poor. Here is a micrograph showing a higher grade FIGO endometrioid carcinoma, FIGO3, in which you see solid sheets of tumor cells, but also very identifiable glands uh, somewhere in the slide. And this here shows characteristic features of clear cell carcinoma, which is by definition high grade. You will see uh, the cytoplasmic clearing, the heart nailing, uh, the prominent vasculatures, and hyalinization. Here I attempted to form this Vogelstein-like model uh, trying to explain the progression of uh, endometrial carcinoma um, in, in, in females. And basically, we try to recap, we, we understand very well in the colon that you have aberrant crypts, you have adenomas, additional mutations, uh, accumulation of mutations and dividing cells and monoclonality and then carcinoma. Here, we have normal glandular endometrium that might acquire a P10 mutation or a PAX2 inactivation. Even after these are acquired, you will still have normal-looking endometrium, but 
with abnormal genetics. In unopposed estrogen conditions, uh, if the conditions are right, you have altered uh, response to hormones, you have monoclonal selection of these mutated cells that rapidly divide and accumulate additional mutations, um, such as KRAS, pinin, microsatellite instability. Then we go to <coughs> hyperplasia uh, with or without atypia. Uh, this is now the new classification, or EIN, uh, which is endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia. Uh, to touch briefly on that, women who are diagnosed with endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia have a, a 46 fold, a 46 increase, fold increase uh, in uh, endometrial adenocarcinoma. And actually, a large number of these women who are diagnosed on biopsy to have EIN will have endometrial adenocarcinoma on hysterical specimen, and that number goes up to almost 40%. And then with accumulation of additional mutations, we get intermediate adenocarcinoma. On the high-grade serous uh, carcinoma pathway, which is a little bit different, we don't know much about it. But basically what happens is it's older women, they have a trophic endometrium, they acquire P, uh, P53 mutations, aneuploides, uh, Pax2 inactivations, uh, and then they develop precursor uh, serous intraepithelial carcinoma, uh, sometimes referred to as P53 signature. We have a very similar process that happened in the tubes, um, in the fallopian tubes as well. Uh, and once they lose the heterozygosity for P53, and of course, by definition, P16 as well, they become serous carcinomas. Here you will see benign endometrial glands, and on top of them, we see these high grade nuclei, really large cells where high nuclear cytoplasmic mutation, as you can see here. This is abnormal, and here it's normal. So this basically is what we call serous intraepithelial carcinoma. Uh, and when we do P53, you see that the P53 protein is retained in all of these nuclei. While in normal cells over here, it's sporadically expressed in the wild type. This pathway is complex. I would like to point out that you may have here P53 inactivation and serous carcinoma. You might have late P53 inactivation, and then you will see a mixed phenotype carcinoma in which you will have an endometrial carcinoma along with a serous carcinoma in the same uterus. Now, in this uh, day and age, this is being more commonly recognized as pathologists are aware uh, of these particular events and the pathogenesis uh, cancer. Very quickly on the genetic alterations, the most common thing is P10 mutations. They're relatively common, seen in about 80% um, of endometrial uh, carcinomas. Uh, there are loss of functional mutations. Uh, basically, P10 encodes uh, a phosphatase protein uh, enzyme uh, that is important in uh, genomic information stability. Uh, we don't have really enough time to go into P10 mutations because I want to touch on other mutations and delve more in depth in the beta-catene pathway. We have KRAS mutations, which have been proposed to have a synergistic role with P10 mutations, but this only occurs in about 10% of endometrial cancer. Other mutations that are relatively common, such as uh, these are not mutations, but these are hypermutilation, microsatellite instability, that is epigenetic, um, and of course, very rarely, very rarely, Lynch <coughs> syndrome. Um, also, aneuploides, we see these commonly in high grade tumors and high grade serous carcinomas, and P53 mutations that are present in about 95% of serous carcinomas and about 17% of intermediate carcinomas. Here again, I just wanted to show the difference between the wild type P53 and the mutated P53 we spoke about these previously. Genetic alterations, the beta catenin pathway. This is what I really want to present today. Uh, beta catenin is a protein that belongs to the E catenin family of proteins. They are really important in tissue architecture because they are E catenins, as we all know. Uh, they are also beta catenin is really important in transcription um, activation during development. Uh, during biogenesis and also in carcinogenesis, as I will show, uh, it's a downstream transcription of activator in the canonical uh, wingless pathway that is the wing slash beta catenin pathway. It plays an important role there, and we'll go through the pathways step by step. 
uh, it's also, as I mentioned, essential in cell differentiation, cell duplication as well. Um, and accumulation uh, of beta catenin in the cytoplasm, as I will show, translocates it into the nuclei of cells, uh, in which it uh, binds TCFLF1 and induces transcription uh, of the wind target genes. This here is a diagram that I spent a great deal uh, of time uh, designing. Uh, it's oversimplistic, uh, so please start from that, but I want to get a message across here. Basically, uh, wind is, uh, is different than the other pathways because wind is extracellular. It's not part of the intracellular pathway, uh, not like the MAP kinase pathway and other pathways that we look at. Uh, basically, it's inhibited uh, by, by other uh, wind ligand inhibitors. Wind binds uh, two receptors, the fissile protein receptor, which is the important component here. Uh, it is in the broad category of G protein coupled receptors. Uh, it has seven transmembrane alpha helices that span the membrane. Uh, also, the other protein, LRP5 or 6, it's not just one, it's, it's one, it's either 5 or it's either 6. Uh, also sits here uh, as a wind uh, uh, receptor. When wind is inhibited and it's not uh, bound to its receptors, the disheveled protein, it's a very nice name for a protein, the disheveled protein, we don't get to say that much, so I'm going to say it a lot today. Uh, <laughs> the disheveled protein is, 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 is inhibited. Uh, and also, uh, when the disheveled protein is inhibited, we have a set of five proteins. These five proteins make up the beta-catenin destruction protein. One of them over here is the uh, glycogen synthase kinase, protein axine, casein uh, synthase kinase 3, PP2A, which is uh, protein phosphatase 2A that has been found, it's an exciting protein, because it has been found to be mutated in a number of cancers. Uh, and uh, anti-cancer therapy targeting this gene and protein is actually being designed as in actually in clinical trials uh, and a lot, of a lot of people are using it. And also the well-known adenomatous polyposis coli protein that we know is uh, mutated um, either somatically in colon cancer or a germline uh, mutation in patients with familial adenomatous uh, polyposis coli. Now, these proteins here will phosphorylate uh, the serine thiamine residue in the beta catenin. Uh, and phosphorylating this residue uh, will make it ubiquitinated. And once a protein is ubiquitinated, that means it's ready, it's tagged for proteasome to come and destroy it. Now, proteasomes are these formidable cylindrical proteins that take in protein, chew it, and spit it out as amino acids. That is oversimplistic, but basically that's what it does. Uh, and so, in the presence of this destruction complex, tagging beta catenin, ubiquitating it for destruction by the proteasomes, it keeps beta catenin under control inside the cytoplasm of cell. And while beta catenin is not accumulating protein, ROCO, another uh, fascinating name from the world of molecular biology, uh, inhibits, binds the 2CF left uh, transcriptional factors and inhibits them. An important component of beta catenin protein is the serine thiamine residue, because that is the component that is phosphorylated and that is, um, it's encoded in exon 3 of the beta catenin gene, and that's where we see the gain of function mutation or the stabilizing mutations in beta catenin that we'll talk about. So this uh, protein here, this residue here is really important uh, when it comes to uh, carcinogenesis through the beta catenin pathways. Uh, now let's see what happens when the wind ligand is no longer inhibited and it's bound to its uh, protein receptors on the surface of cells. Basically what happened, the shovel protein is activated uh, and it phosphorylates this uh, destruction complex. Uh, this is oversimplistic, but basically uh, it, it inhibits this protein from uh, tagging uh, on a equilating um, beta catenin. And so what happens is beta catenin accumulates. It literally goes through the roof inside the cytoplasm. 
And when there is so much of it, it gets translocated inside the nucleus. When spadecatenin is translocated inside the nucleus, it kicks away broco, it binds to TCF left complex, um, and this activates the wind. This is a transcriptional activator for the wind target genes. What are the wind target genes? Uh, I will touch briefly on cycling D1, but before I go there, I just wanted to show you uh, the retinoplastoma protein. The retinoplastoma protein is an important protein. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically, it has, it, it basically it suppresses uh, tumors by suppressing uh, cell, uh, uh, it by controlling or helping uh, repress cell division proliferation. Uh, basically what it does is it binds to the transcriptional factor E2F and its dimerization partner. By binding this, it sequesters these transcriptional factors, inhibiting their activity. What the cycling does is it, we have the dependent kinase 4, which is the cycling dependent kinase 4, is activated. Once this protein is activated, what it does is it phosphorylates the retinoplastoma gene, changing its conformation and uh, preventing it from sequestering the E2F transcriptional factor and its dimerization protein. Once E2F and its dimerization protein are free to do what they want to do, what they do is what they do best, which is they bind promoter region on the DNA and gene and induce transcription uh, of genes that are important in cell cycle uh, promotion, in cell proliferation and division. And the uninhibited uh, proliferation of cells, as we know, is cancer by definition. So this N pathway here is very common in multiple cancers. The P53 pathway also ends in a very similar fashion with uh, the retinoplastoma gene being phosphorylated and an inhibited action of the ETF um, transcription dimerization particle by forming this box on um, transcription box on these promoter regions. Going back to our uh, beta-catenin mutation, the beta-catenin mutation that we're going to be talking about today happens in exon 3, in that area of the serine threonine residue that codes for that. And by mutating this, beta-catenin can no longer be destroyed because it can no longer be tagged. It can no longer be upiculated uh, in the cell cycle. So what we will have is just stabilized beta-catenin that keeps uh, accumulating in the cell in the cytoplasm, translocated into the nuclei, inducing the one target G, cell proliferation, cell division, as I have shown you. Uh, other uh, transcriptional factors activated by the one target is CMIC. We all know about these mutations. We have all done our heme path rotations, right? Uh, and also matrix metalloprotein A7. And if Dr. Amin is here today, he has done some work on this one. Beta-catenin happens in about 25.5% of, of endometrial adenocarcinoma. It's not seen in non-endometrial adenocarcinomas, um, or at least not reported. Uh, it's about 31. The, the incidence here goes a little bit higher, up to 31, in microsatellite instable tumors. Uh, I don't know what the exact connection is to the microsatellite instability, uh, but this number here uh, hints that there might be some sort of a link. And as we all know, that all of these pathways are somewhere, somehow linked together. Now, let's look at something that is very, that I found very interesting, very exciting, uh, and I think is opening uh, doors in the world of uh, uh, tumor carcinogenesis, uh, which is SOC17. But before we go there, I just want to point our attention that we have known that SOX17 and beta-catenin basically interact uh, to promote transcription, to inhibit things, to, to do other things. We also know that the wind catenin pathway can regulate and can control SOX17 expression. So basically what happens is when we have the accumulation of beta-catenin inside uh, the cytoplasm and it's translocated inside the nuclei, it binds TCF. TCF here is T cell factor, uh, and, and, this, and, and this combination here activates the transcription of SOX17. Now, we have shown you how the canonical signal mm -hmm. activates SOX17. Now I'm going to show you something that is exactly the opposite of this. We have also come to know that the SOX proteins regulate the canonical wingless pathway through the same interaction between beta-catenin and SOX17, and this one is a physical 
interaction between the two proteins. They act as co-suppressors of the wind target gene transcription by, when you have your SOC17 targets, you have uh, beta catenin binding SOC17, an activation of your SOC17 targets. Beta catenin is no longer bound to the TCF left complex. So the, the wind uh, pathway is inhibited, but it's inhibited way downstream at the transcriptional level. Uh, basically, this year, I, what I tried to recreate here is a scale or a balance to show you that the interaction between beta catenin and TCF left and SOC17 is balanced, it's very delicate, and it's very tissue dependent. So what happens in, in one tissue does not, not necessarily mean it's the same exact thing that happened in a different set of tissues. What we have here is that beta catenin can either go this way and come back this way, or it can just go this way. But it will only function in one direction at a time. So it's kind of a balance. Uh, are there any questions in this area here before I move on? I'm last I think time to explain this one. Uh, Sox gene family. Let's talk a little bit about these uh, fascinating family of genes of over 30 members. Basically, they are all high mobility group uh, DNA uh, binding proteins uh, that uh, regulate transcription. They are really important in development in embryogenesis. Uh, we have known that they are important in calcinogenesis as well, and I will show you uh, how that happens in endometrial cancer, what we believe happens. And as you can imagine, that these SOX proteins sh share related sequences, target sequences, with TCF left one. We know that these both bind to beta catenin, and also there's some research that shows overlapping binding sites. Uh, these 30 members are classified into seven groups. SOX17 belongs to SOX group F. SOX group F also includes SOX7 and SOX18. These proteins in particular are really important during development, in endogenesis, during carcinogenesis. Uh, they play an important role in the formation of the endoderm, liver, pancreas, the gut. They also play an important role in oligodendrocyte development and also oligodendrocyte regeneration. There is fascinating research on oligodendrocyte uh, regenerations to the SOX17 pathway that unfortunately we don't have to have time to get into, but I really urge everyone with interest in regeneration to look these articles up. It's also important in vascular development and angiogenesis, and as we know, angiogenesis is part of carcinogenesis and tumor formation. And it also plays an important role during hematopoiesis. Um, SOX17 is detected pretty early in the endoderm, in the external video endoderm, during embryo day six. Uh, mouse models with knocked out SOX17 are lethal at about embryo day 10. So we know that this uh, protein is really important and is, 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 is irreplaceable during embryogenesis. Uh, the target genes uh, for SOX17 are mostly endodermal targets. Uh, that includes HNF1 beta. Uh, that's a familiar marker here in, uh, in the world of surgical pathology. Uh, it's important in liver formation and also kidneys, um, tubular formation. Uh, SOX17 basically binds a very specific sequence in the minor group of DNA. Uh, and activating the transcription of many of these trans genes and transcriptional factors. Among them are GATA 4, 5, and 6. Um, so basically, to summarize uh, a little bit, uh, SOX17 plays an important role in regenesis, cell division, uh, and also tumor regenesis. Uh, it's involved in pathways for hepatocellular carcinomas, colorectal carcinomas, gastric carcinomas, esophageal carcinomas, lung carcinomas, breast carcinomas. Many pathways, but it plays a different role in each one of them. Uh, SOX17 has two properties that helps it play a role in carcinogenesis. They either play a tumor suppressor role or they collaborate in tumor formation. They collaborate in tumor formation. One of the methods it does that is through angiogenesis. Overexpression of sex 17 induces uncontrolled angiogenesis. And that is one of the ways that we, that's part of tumor genesis. That's a very, very part of tumor genesis. 
uh, it also suppresses tumor formation by suppressing the one pathway uh, target genes, and we have spoken about these. So that part is a tumor suppressor. So when we looked at this protein, we looked at some more literature. We found an interesting finding is that SOX17 represents a potentially novel mediator of PR expression in murine endometria in the uterus of murine. So we looked at this. Is SOX17 related to, is there any role in endometrial cancer? We know it plays a lot of roles in alpha carcinomas. There is definitely a link through the beta catenin pathway. There is a link through progesterone in uterus. So, so our question was, is SOX17 expressed in benign and malignant endometrial? So to answer this question, like any self-respecting pathologist, we all have dish micro arrays that we test stuff on. It's a cheap way of testing uh, new markers. Basically, we have 41 cases, five of them were benign, and 36 of them were um, endometrial adenocarcinomas, mostly type 1. There were a few type 2 there. Uh, and we scored the intensity of the staining, 0 as negative, 1 weak, 3 strong, and 2 as intermediate or moderate. So this here is a low-power view for tissue microarray. Uh, there were two patches for each uh, tumor of each blind endometrium. Uh, here you see strongly expressed SOX17 in brine endometrium, expressed but a little bit weaker than the benign endometrium. Over there, this is a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, endometrial adenocarcinoma, in which it's also strongly. Uh, you uh, recorded intensity as well? Or just we recorded intensity for the purposes of these uh, fish microarrays, but we also recorded percentage, and I, w I will talk about that. I'm going to show you exactly what we have done, because I think what we have done is a very nice way of recording intensity and scoring these things. Here, you see benign endometrium, mice glands, single cell layer, spaced apart, very beautiful, expressed SOX17, very intensely, very strongly, very uniformly, malignant glands, triploforming glands, but they're still glands, so this is a really well differentiated endometrioid carcinoma that also expresses <coughs> SOX17. What we saw is, all of these five benign cases, all of them express SOX17 very nicely, very strongly, very diffusely. But the 36 carcinoma cases expressed it, 72% expressed um, SOX17. And the intensity was about 1.5. It really ranged from one cancer to the other. Uh, there was one serous papillary carcinoma that was really intensely positive, and there is uh, one clear cell carcinoma in that DNA that was negative. So now these results bring up additional questions. So here we concluded that, yes, SOX17 is expressed in endometrium, benign endometrium, and malignant endometrium. To what extent, we don't know yet. Uh, we know that it's a little bit reduced in the endometrial carcinoma. Uh, and so we asked ourselves, could it be a diagnostic marker? Could it be a prognostic marker? Could it help us tell the stage or the FIGO grade of a tumor? So we investigated this. But before that, let's just delve here a little bit into a clinical scenario or a clinical problem that is not extremely common, but is not uncommon. Uh, basically, the diagnosis of primary endometrial carcinoma is easy. If you don't have a diagnostic sample, you'll get a diagnostic sample. You have the entire uterus in front of you. Grading it sometimes is a little bit challenging, but we work with that. Uh, there is a challenge sometimes in identifying the cell type. We overcome these challenges as well. But what happens is because endometrial cancer is becoming a chronic disease and patients, the survival is really long, these patients 10, 15 years down the line will present with a lung metastasis. Many times you're not even getting clinical history. The physician says, oh, this, is, this was 10, 15 years ago. What are you talking about? This, this patient is cured. We've cured her endometrial cancer. Uh, and so you look at it, wow, this is an adenocarcinoma. There is a morphological overlap. Uh, and sometimes you might not even be sure it's this lung. Is this, especially if it's a single solitary nodule, is this lung, is this endometrium? So there is a need for a diagnostic marker to help us there. We know that TTF1, which is thyroid transcription factor, is pretty sensitive and specific uh, for lung carcinomas and lung tissue. But it also stains 19% of endometrial carcinomas. Uh, and that, of course, varies again by, uh, 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 by the exact marker, by the exact uh, clone of TTF1 we're using. We have SOX8, which is a good marker. Formulary, taxate, sorry, 
Max H, which is a, a good mar marker for mullerian carcinomas, but it's positive in renal cell carcinomas. It's positive in thyroid as well. So we ask the question, is SOX17 a diagnostic marker? Before we go there, we want to determine SOX17 expression in lung cancer, because we have to know if it's expressed in lung cancer or not. And we already know that SOX17 plays a role through its methylation in lung cancer. When SOX17 is methylated in lung cancer, the wind pathway is uninhibited. So that is the uh, genome expressive role that uh, it's not playing because it's being silenced through methylation. And a great deal, almost 60 or 70 percent uh, of lung uh, adenocarcinomas show SOX17 having methylation. We already also know that promoter hypermethylation of inhibitors of Wnt ligand are there in lung adenocarcinomas, but we don't have mutations in the components of the Wnt abet pathway. It's also, I think, worth to note that SOX17 expression um, uh, in um, cell cultures uh, or cell lines, flank cancer, actually suppresses the tumor. So it plays a really good tumor suppressor role there. So again, what we did, we went to our TMAs. We had about 129 primary lung adenocarcinoma tumors, about 198 primary lung squamous cell carcinoma tumors, and they were all completely negative for SOX17. There was completely no so what do we do next? We went and we pulled out nine primary endometrial carcinomas along with metastasis from each one of these cases. These were all metastatic cases. Among these were four that were metastatic to the lung. What we saw is very intense, very nice SOX17 expression in all of these tumors, including the primary tumors, including the metastatic tumors. So right there, we realized, wow, we have a diagnostic marker in our hand that will help us solve a relevant clinical problem. Uh, we saw that it's expressed in metastatic endometrial cancer, in primary endometrial cancer, and also in benign endometrial. And SOX17 is not expressed in the lung. So now let's just take a quick look at these results and figure out what they mean. Can SOX17 expression predict prognosis? We're going to look into that. Can it correlate with FICO-K? How is it related to the pathway? What we did is we had 12 patients, 20 cases, whole slides, endometrial cancer, again with their matched uh, metastases. We stained those for SOX17. We stained them for botocatenin. We also stained them. We, we also uh, looked at the intensity of the nuclear expression at the percentage of cells that express on all levels of expression intensity. And I will show you what we did. This is my table. This is my raw data table. And so you have here zero expression, 5% of the tumor cell. One plus expression, which is weak, 15% of the tumor cells. Intermediate, 30%, and strong, 30%. So we multiply 3 by 50, 2 by 30, 1 by 15, one by 0, and we have a total score of 300. So the total score is 300. This carcinoma in particular is called 223. Uh, and this has been validated by prior publications in this field. Uh, so what we saw is that the primary endometrial tumors had a range of intensity between 60 to 255 with an average intensity of 155 and a median of 160. We have noted that the expression pattern is really heterogeneous, as uh, Jamie spoke about last week, about tumor heterogeneity, uh, and also that the deeper invasive portions of the tumor showed low expression. Here, this is one tumor, this is another tumor, complete negativity, weak to intermediate, and strongly positive. This is all within the same tumor. On the other hand, the metastatic tumors showed higher average intensity and median of score. So when we compare them together, the primary average score was 155, and the metastatic average score was 210. That is significant. That is a big difference. And we were not exactly sure what was going there. Uh, a possible explanation, of course, is these tissues are processed differently, uh, fixation, time to fixation, and all of these other uh, variables and pre analytics. And also tumor heterogeneity. Now let's look at SOX17 expression uh, by FIGO grade. So FIGO grade 1 is really intense. FIGO grade 1 is our low grade endometrial cancer. FIGO 2 and 3 are considered to be high grade, <coughs> and they have lower intensity. So that there just tells us that this marker can play a prognostic role. 
Uh, we also did beta catenin, and beta catenin uh, was positive. You can see here the nuclear uh, expression of beta catenin is being retained inside the nuclei. In about 47% of cases, we showed, and others have also showed, uh, that beta catenin. Uh, really highlights the squamous differentiation really nicely. Almost every single nuclei here uh, has uh, beta catenin retention. So, in conclusion of our study, beta catenin is expressed in benign endometrium, malignant endometrium, and in endometrial cases. Beta catenin is also expressed in intermediate carcinomas in relationship to SOX17 expression. It really nicely highlights the squamous differentiation. Um, it also is differentially expressed in endometrial carcinomas when compared to lung adenoid carcinomas. Uh, there is higher expression in metastasis uh, than uh, the primary tumor. We think that may be pre-analytic. We're doing additional studies to figure that out. Uh, but also we think that there might be a collaborative role for SOX17 in endometrial cancer rather than a tumor suppressor role mm -hmm. in endometrial cancer. Uh, so we think that SOX17 can be a prognostic marker in uh, uh, endometrial carcinomas the same way that it's an uh, a prognostic marker in other tumors. I will show that in like less than two minutes. Uh, and the limitations here, obvious sample size is really small. We have not validated any of this through the best transcriptase uh, expression studies or Western blood. So let's shift gears here very quickly into prognostic effects of SOX17. This one slide here shows that first melanoma and superior carcinomas that down-regulate SOX17 do much worse than those with normal SOX17 expression. They actually have lower overall survival um, and it always predicts a higher stage on a higher grade of tumor. SOX17 as a diagnostic marker, not long time ago, there was a publication on the SOX17 expression uh, in the seminormal component of mixed germ cell tumors that is particularly helpful in diagnosing these tumors sometimes, and it's negative in all the other components. Uh, a publication here or a presentation at the US CAP for a study from Dr. Lee and his colleagues from the University of Rochester that represented that was presented this year as well showed that TSF, which is similar to SOX17, um, and is down um, stream of the wind beta catenin pathway, is expressed on the non seminoma component of these mixed germ cell tumors, and is only expressed in about eight percent of seminoma. Future endeavors. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's a, an indicator of success for me when I have more questions at the end of my research project than I have answers. Uh, this gives me future endeavors. This gives me future projects. This gives me direction. So, what's the role of the CPG island promoter methylation in the carcinoma? That is a question that needs to be answered. Uh, what is the role of SOX17 expression clinically for clinicians? Can that help us? Uh, uh, prognose, can this become more of a mainstream thing? We don't know. Can we use it? We don't know. What is the exact role of TCF and LEF uh, in tumor carcinogenesis and an area of my interest also in colorectal carcinomas? How do these markers and transcriptional factors interact um, to form cancer in these areas? This is our SOX group. Um, this is at the US CAB. This is me, by the way, in case you can see the resemblance. I was there. Uh, Tracy, our wonderful PSF, who has done a great job in this project. She has helped me so much. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for your mentorship uh, and for reviewing this entire presentation. And Dr. Shu, our collaborator from, the, from UCLA. And I would also like uh, to acknowledge Dr. Lee again for his mentorship, for reviewing my presentation, and for his tireless help and advice and guidance uh, in making this uh, day possible. I would also like to thank Dr. Khalifa for taking me into this fellowship, uh, for helping me throughout and mentoring me throughout my training, and for his uh, insight uh, into various uh, uh, issues of life and pathology. Uh, Dr. Dolan and draft committee for the opportunity to stand before you here today and present this meeting. So thank you again uh, to Mariam uh, uh, and Stacy and Prachi and Dr. Klein for teaching me perseverance and inspiring me to persevere, work hard, um, and be more careful looking at uh, patient samples 
and paying attention to detail. So thank you. Uh, Colleen Forster, also I would like to thank her for her uh, exemplary talent. Uh, she's really very talented uh, in what she does. Uh, and also Jennifer Morocho and the Histology Lab. Uh, I'm glad they're not throwing tomatoes at me today because I have really requested so much of them and they have always delivered on time. Uh, so thank you everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and for giving me this chance. This is a larger series. We're looking at prognosis. We're looking at exact patterns of expression. We're also looking at um, correlating PI expression to SOX17 expression and to beta catenin expression and what the link is between these cases. And uh, Maria and the other guys are helping me. Yes. So, in very high levels of SOX17, you Is this SOX-17 measurable in serum? Is Q-SOX-2 remarkable anywhere? Uh, 
I, I, I don't know. That is very interesting. It's a very interesting question. I really don't know. I, uh, as a surgical pathologist, I, that never appeared to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that is very interesting. Very that is very I'm a clinical pathologist. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a very interesting question. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, answering the question of uh, primary lung cancer versus metastasis and lung cancer, uh, question that we have yeah. in pulmonary pathology. So for lung adenocarcinoma versus metastatic endometriate adenocarcinoma to the lung, we have the option of morphologic features and Pax8. So I don't see SOX17 gaining a lot of track there. But uh, what about the expression of SOX17 in squamous cell? differentiated endometrial and adenocarcinoma. Do you see that really, really high? It, it is, it is expressed there. I didn't put the pictures, but uh, you'll see the DNA gene is expressed there, and also SOX17 highlights these uh, squamous areas. So yes. Yeah. No, that, that is not very helpful, but uh, SOX17 is expressed in squamous cell. And it's completely negative in squamous cell carcinoma. We have seen the large 98 patient disease that we have. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.